from Microbe TV. This is Immune, episode number 59, recorded on August 17th, 2022. I'm Vincent Racaniello, and you're listening to the podcast on the body's defenders against disease. Joining me today right here in Ithaca, New York, Cindy Leifer. Hi. We're finally recording in person together. This That's is right. very exciting. We're in Cindy's office at Cornell University. This is the School of Veterinary Medicine. It is. Yes, it is. Department of... Microbiology and Immunology. Yes. So I was up here for a symposium, so we decided to do an immune. And uh, also joining us from Durham, North Carolina, Steph Langle. Hi there. Great to be here. Really excited to chat with our guest and another another immune is underway. And from Madison, New Jersey, Brianne Barker. Hi, great to be here. Um, I'm excited for this conversation as well. Our guest is a newly arrived faculty here at uh, Cornell University, Mandy McGeechee. Welcome to Immune. Thank you. Thanks for inviting me. And we just spent a long time troubleshooting because I haven't Got a lot of experience streaming from a remote location, but uh, we got it to work. <laughs> what I tell people, they say, oh, how do you figure out how to do this? We're scientists. We can do anything, right? <laughs> we can do anything. Figuring stuff out is kind of what we do. Right. Yep. Yeah, on the fly, right? You, right. Your PCR didn't work. Uh, figure it out, you know? Do it right. again. Your cultures are dead. Your plaques didn't form. Right. So I forgot how to do this particular aspect of it and yeah i found the video and nice. uh it came back right away yeah so it sounds like are. there's a niche for youtube videos about this <laughs> yeah maybe we should do youtube science videos brianne what do you think maybe that could be an interesting <laughs> idea <laughs> all right <laughs> i mean there are some right there's jove oh uh, tons, and, tons. Yeah. which are super useful um yeah. No, we're joking because we have our lectures on YouTube and all these podcasts all are right. on YouTube <laughs> as well. So there's but they're a, not how-to science. So yeah, yeah, they're, not how to, they're not how to do. I mean, you know, methods, like you're, you're right, Joe, Joe, Journal of Experimental. Visual. No, visual. 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 Experiment. Experiment. Yeah, I think visual experiments. Yeah, so that's one to go to if you want to learn how to do things. Mm -hmm. Have you ever made one? No, I talked with them about it and then didn't have time to yeah, do it. Yeah, it's a lot. It's yeah. quite a process. A lot of time. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. It is, so, so I really appreciate the people who do make them because yeah. actually yeah. they are very useful. Um, yeah. But we fill another niche. We talk. <laughs> <laughs> and people can learn from us talking, right? And so today we're going to learn from you, Mandy. Um, we want to learn a bit about your science. But first, tell us your, uh, your history. Go back to where you were from. My <laughs> life story. Yes, your life story. <laughs> Well, so I will start with the beginning because I have a weird accent and a lot of people think I'm Australian, although I've never yet been to Australia. I would love to go. Um, so I was actually born in South Africa um, and lived there until I was 15. And then my family immigrated to Scotland. Um, so I finished high school in Scotland, which was um, a big transition. It's kind of tough moving when you're a teenager to a different yeah. continent. Yeah. Um, sure. But it was fine. And then uh, I went to the University of Glasgow, uh, actually initially to study veterinary medicine. Um, so I grew up reading all the James Herriot books and mm. loving science, but also uh, loving animals and the idea of being a vet. I was going to be a vet during the day and a writer at night. And I guess in some ways I've, I've sort of <laughs> <Yeah>. done that. <laughs> um, so in the UK, you go straight into vet school. It's not a graduate program. Um, so I started, I was fortunate enough to get in and I started and pretty quickly started realizing that maybe actually being a clinical vet wasn't actually what I wanted to do, but I really enjoyed the science part. So after three years, they had this uh, program where to encourage more vets to do science, a bit like, you know, vet PhD programs here, where you could go and get a bachelor of science for one or two years, and then you were supposed to come back to vet school. Um, right. That's very I, different than um, the, the education system here in the U.S. Mm -hmm. and how veterinary school works. Right. 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 Um, yeah. And so, sorry, go on. Oh, no. no yeah, go, go ahead. ahead. Yeah. So what it did mean was that we did a lot more basic science courses in those first few years as well. Um, 
that you would have done. But anyway, so I decided, well, that seems like a good option to go and take a break and do that. And then also uh, when I was asking around, this is how I ended up being an immunologist. I went and spoke to an advisor and he suggested doing immunology. We had done a very brief immunology course. Uh, but what he said, which I think is very true, is uh, immunology affects everything. Mm -hmm. So the Im immunity um, um, information affects all of body systems so it'll be useful for whatever you do and I was like that's a great point and then also the immunology course at Glasgow helped you to find a summer internship often in the US and I thought well that's a great opportunity to go to the US for the summer yeah. so that's how I ended up uh, doing immunology and I loved it and I decided to at the end of that to actually go and do a PhD rather than going back to vet school um, so I feel like in some ways now coming back to the vet school at Cornell is kind of a little bit returning to my roots, but maybe more where I should be on the basic science side. Um, yeah, so I went and did my PhD in Edinburgh with Steve Anderton studying t regulatory T cells in autoimmune uh, disease using a model of multiple sclerosis, mm -hmm. uh, the EAE model, which we still use now. Um, and then uh, at the end of that, I, having done the summer in um, Alex Cart's lab, who uh, he was uh, a physician scientist who had worked with Mark Jenkins. And so I got to be part of Mark Jenkins' general clubs and lab meetings and things, which was awesome. That, yeah, that was probably really exciting. It was a time. really great experience, yeah. And, and again, really kind of confirmed for me that this is what I wanted to do uh, long term. Um, I'd wanted to come back to the US to do a postdoc. And so I uh, interviewed at different places and um, actually ended up uh, taking a position, an industry postdoc, um, which I know nowadays a lot of people are seeking out. I actually interviewed in four academic labs and one industry lab, and that was the project that most excited me, um, as well as the resources and the PI. And again, getting to live in California for a few years was a bonus. Um, I do believe that what you do outside of the lab is really important too. And so, Mandy, can you tell us a little bit more about that industry postdoc and, and what do you think the differences are between academic and industry postdocs? And secondly, you mentioned that you chose that because it was the best project or best science. And so how does that play, you think, into making a postdoc decision? Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, and obviously that's something I get asked quite a bit because a lot of students and postdocs are interested in making that decision and how do you choose? So... Uh, I guess the first thing I'll say is industry postdocs are not uh, like one fits all. Uh, there's a lot of variation between different companies and how they do it. Um, but for me, I went to uh, DNAX, which was sharing plow at the time. Now it's part of Merck and they actually, Merck Research Labs have a separate postdoc program. Um, but I, I was really uh, looking for projects that interested me. And at the time, Dan Kua had just published about uh, IL-23 driving pathogenic cells and this new subset of T cells that produce IL-17 to drive uh, inflammation and autoimmune disease. And I thought that was really fascinating. And I also, uh, at the time, was thinking that maybe I should do something other than regulatory T cells and branch out because that was a very popular area. And then I jumped into TH17, which became a <laughs> yeah. hugely popular, popular. area. <laughs> um, but fortunately, I was in the right lab to be able to have the tools and resources and input to uh, make some uh, important contributions to that field as it was developing. Um, so I do think... Uh, the most important thing I think is finding the work that interests you because then you're going to be driven to go to work every day and to, to push yourself harder, but also having the right uh, group and PI and mentor um, who's going to help you develop. And whether that's an industry or academia, I think that's equally important because um, also for industry, you're still training and learning um, how to do that work. So you need to develop. Um, and so actually, the, the, you were asking about the differences between industry and academia. At the time, the research program and the postdoc program at DNAX was very much run as a research program. So the postdocs were kind of protected from a lot of the industry operations. Um, and we were really encouraged to do the research and not be too involved in a lot of the other stuff. Um, 
but obviously you got exposure to it and you learn about what other things people in the lab who were doing more um you know, development related projects we're doing. Um, and over time that did change when Merck uh, acquired Sharing Plow, uh, the whole site became much more development oriented than it had been in the past. And so I saw those changes and how uh, more kind of, um, I guess, corporate focused places work and operate. Um, and I was actually uh, fortunate to be offered a, a senior scientist position at the end of my postdoc, which again, that's something I kind of warn people about is a lot of postdoc programs in industry, they don't actually want to hire from their own program to stay in the company. They're actually for those hiring in as senior scientists and PIs, they're often looking from outside their own company. So getting into a postdoc program isn't necessarily a step into mm, okay. um, a industry position. Um, although these days, it's, uh, there's a lot of these positions around, so even doing a postdoc isn't as required. Um, and yeah, and then so it was really when I became a senior scientist that I started seeing more of the the development side of projects and um, and having tried it out, decided that actually I wanted to come back to academia and have more autonomy over what I worked on. Um, so I have a question about that. Yeah. Um, so I guess you know, when did you make a decision that you were interested in industry? And there is this idea out there that once you go into industry, it's not possible to come back to academia. And so um, obviously that is not true in your case. Um, so can you tell us a little bit about how you made that decision and how that transition works? What should a student or, a, you know, someone who's thinking yeah. about this know? Um so I think it's definitely true that more people go into industry and stay there than the other way around. But there are other people who have come out of industry and gone back to academia. Um, Fiona Powery was one or um, Jen Gilmer was Toronto. at Genentech and is now at Pitt. Um, I think a lot of the reason people often stay is because there are really great opportunities and, and uh the, the, well, the stresses are just different. <laughs> so it's kind of what you, what you prefer. Um, for me, I think I realized that I, I really like to be the driver of my projects, but also I really like the academic freedom of seeing something interesting. My, my favorite projects and also often the projects that lead to the biggest papers are the ones where you see something really weird or unexpected and then you follow it up and branch off into a new area that your lab wasn't necessarily working on before, but, you know, find collaborators and, and just do it given if you can get funding to do it, that's, that's the, yep. the hard part of it <laughs> because there's never, no job is perfect. Um, Rather than, whereas in industry, I think one of the key things is you can, you can do amazing science and there are amazing resources, but you are working for a company that has goals that are, have to be around ultimately making a product that's going to sell. And so, um, as part of that, you do, there are times when you do have to be able to walk away from a project and to, maybe work on a project that you're less interested in, but is necessary for the company. And so uh, you actually need a lot of flexibility in industry and um, which equally, like I said, for me in academia, that's one of the nice things you go and learn new things all the time too. So, um, but you often are not the one in chart in control of what those project changes are around you. So uh for me, that wasn't, I found that more stressful than the responsibility of getting funding. Um, although I do find actually the most stressful part of running a lab is the responsibility of funding the people in my lab. Oh, yeah. It's more than my own job. It's um, looking after the people that you're employing, which I think I hadn't anticipated as much <laughs> when I initially looked. So. so I have a question. One of the things that students are always wondering about um, in industry is how does working there impact your publications? Because you have some really fantastic publications during that time that you were working in industry, and that isn't right. always the case, and that Definitely. can influence that transition back to academia. So can you talk about yes. that a little bit? Yeah, no, that's a, that is a really great point. And 
and hugely varies across different mm-hmm. postdoc programs. Um, so that is something I would say to people, if you're looking for an industry postdoc, look at the lab that you're applying to and what have they published in the last few years and what is the company uh, culture and policy around publishing. Um, so for example, at the time at DNAX postdocs, mostly we're working on projects where we knew we could publish because they weren't going to be subject to IP or patent. But there were a couple of people who started stumbled into that where what they did was part of a patent application or, um, you know, it also happens where for some companies they want to publish a big paper when a big, when the new drug is coming out so that they can kind of, and so they, yeah, they want to hold things back or time things and, and those kind of things can definitely have an impact when you need to publish and then get on to your next job. Um, so I was fortunate. I will say I've never, I've never been someone who had like the five or 10 year plan. I always kind of just went for what's the next step and what interests me or what's the next opportunity. And so I didn't know, like think it through the time, but I was really fortunate to go somewhere where, uh, they were publishing and I was able to publish, um, because that was what enabled me to transition back to academia. And so I think definitely if that's something that you're thinking about that you really need to find, and there are really great, I mean, Genentech, I think has a fantastic postdoc program and, um, you can, uh, get a great experience, publish great papers, and then have those options. Um, and there's other places to, um, and you can tell a lot by, you know, look at their record. It doesn't matter what they say, look at the record. Are they actually, they might say you can publish, but are, is that group publishing? And what's the priority in terms of, because I, I mean, you can understand for companies, a lot of what it takes to get answer the reviewers and those last two figures that you end up adding in, they're not necessarily what the program needs for data, um, but they can take a lot of time and money. So yeah, the just, just priorities are different. Um, and yeah, you can judge a lot of that ahead of time by seeing what they're doing. So when did you know you were going to make the transition back to academia? Like how far into the postdoc were you and and Uh, was it finishing up and you were ready to look for a job and what influenced that decision? Yeah, so it was actually after I I was a senior scientist for, I think for two years. Um, And and part of that was, you know, we had a lot of uncertainty, so we were immigrants. granted white immigrants. So I know that my experience is easier than a lot of other immigrants, but still we were going through the visa process. My husband had to apply for an H1 visa um, and he got it in a year when something like 40% of people got it. So we weren't sure if we were going back to the UK or not. Um, and then we were having our first child. So the opportunity to move to a senior scientist position and stay there and continue doing the work was very attractive at that point. And so I thought, well, let's try it out. Um, but I remember one day standing in the lab and having a discussion with my advisor, um, who has published, you know, really important papers in the TH17 field. But he was basically saying that he's been, he was relatively protected because he was publishing and producing so much so he was able to continue doing research he wanted and he he was basically saying well if you want to be I won't say the people he said but you know if you want to be one of these known top people in the field uh publishing these papers he's like you can't do it in industry you should really or it's just much harder you should um you know this isn't the place to do it and that kind of struck home for me, not, not so much for the, oh, I I have to be that celebrity scientist, but just the, you know, I, I want to keep doing this type of work and publishing it, getting a patent isn't, I I know in in academia we're supposed to get patents too, but I've always felt like publishing your work and collaborating and sharing it and not being, not feeling like you have to keep it for a certain amount of time is, is more important. So um, yeah, so I think for me, that was a key moment of like, okay, I think I do actually want to at this point go back to academia. And then I also realized when I looked, you know, you every now and again, you have to do these self-assessments and there's points in your career when you're very attractive to people for certain positions. And then there's other points when you're not. And so at that point, I had two good publications in Nature Immunology we had another project on the go that I could, you know, talk about of, of new data. So I knew, okay, at this point, 
I potentially have an opportunity to get a faculty position. But if I wait a couple of years and I keep working on these other projects where I'm not going to publish, it's going to be much, much harder. Mm -hmm. So that's, it was that's the right a, time to do really it great story and a really interesting nuance. I think for people who are going on the market and there's a lot of people going on the market, and I'm seeing a lot of positions open, but what you're speaking to is this time where you're most attractive mm -hmm. as a candidate. So you noted maybe two things, publications that have recently yeah. come off and the capacity to build a program. You know, like you said, you have something that's kind of brewing and you can pitch that as this will be my, my R01. Are those right. two main things and anything else that maybe we could tell the, those who are seeking positions that could help that, that chance? I think those are, I mean, Not I think also, ones. again, yeah. just take whatever opportunities you get. So if you get a chance to go and present at a conference, especially mm -hmm. now when it's been harder to do that, do it. Or if you get asked to write, uh, especially like news and views or opinions pieces, mm -hmm. do that. Do, do anything you can to kind of, um, I mean, I think of it as it's a little bit branding, right? In science, it, it does help to get known a bit. Um, and I'm not saying I'm super well known, but I just think take those opportunities when you get them to go and give talks because it's all practice as well. Right. Um, and then again, having good advisors come in. So I will say when I did go on the job market, I did not know what a chalk talk was and I <laughs> sucked. It was awful. I'm like, I'm embarrassed when I think about the chalk talks that I gave because I really had no clue. And I had this idea of what I thought they were. And so that's what I did. And now that, <laughs> now that I actually know it's, it was, I, I was very grateful that I got the position that I did because, um, Actually, they didn't do a chalk talk, so that was probably part of it. <laughs> <laughs> well, and for, for um, our so audience, uh, sorry. A, a chalk. Oh, I was going. Sorry, um, for our, our audience who may not know, right. a chalk talk for most academic positions, it, like you said, it, it may not be all, but this is a time where you go into a room with your potential future colleagues, people who are on the commit, the search committee, right? And you are going to write on the board basically what are your people have described it to be your R01 aims, right? What yeah. are the, what are the the points in your program that you're going to ask and how are you going to fund that? And people can pepper you with questions. They can, you know, it's, it's very open forum, which I think is what makes it yeah. scary. And it's much yeah. more about next steps as opposed yes, to what right. you what, have done. What's interesting is that there was a time when that's all we had, chalk talks. Right, right. I mean, it's probably before all of us because I even remember we didn't have PowerPoints, but we had physical right. slides, right? Right. But before that, right. you did it on the board. And yeah. I remember there was a an enzyme an enzyme club at Rockefeller that used to meet once a month, mm -hmm. and you could not do anything but a chalk talk. Huh. And I remember incredibly prominent people coming and just drawing on the board. It was a skill. Wow. It is a skill and it's something you need to practice. And um, yes, if I had known, I would have, I would have practiced more and got people to, <laughs> to help me with that more. So, um, and again, you just keep trying and it, you know, it worked out and, and I ended up at the university of Pittsburgh, which was a really great place for me, mostly because it was, I was within a group that was very nurturing and I had a, advisor and mentor and Sarah Gaffin, who really was the one who recruited me there, um, who taught me, took, was willing, very generous with her time and willing to teach me the process. Cause again, I went to school in Scotland. I did an industry postdoc. I'd never worked in the U S acad academic system. And so I, I had to learn all of like, how do you write an NIH grant and, and again, she was kind and she didn't laugh at me the first time I showed her <laughs> specific games ideas, you know. Um, so having, having those seeking out mentors and advisors who not just your formal advisor who's been assigned to you, but the people who actually are willing to give their time and energy and are, are personally invested in your success because they're the ones who will make a huge difference. Um, and advocates, you need someone who can advocate for you, um, which again was something Sarah did and something I now appreciate and try to do for other people too of, you know, she put me up for talks or she put me up for awards that I wouldn't have done myself and didn't fully understand at the time how important those things are. Um, and so uh, finding 
again, finding those advocates or being that advocate for other people, I think is really important um, in science. So I'm, that helps a huge amount. Um, what, what, yeah. are the, what are the colors of uh, pit? Blue and gold. Blue and gold? Yeah. I thought it was black and yellow. Oh, that's that's Pittsburgh in general. Yes, the Steelers and the Pirates. Because that's what I tell pens. people. It's a sports town. Yeah. When people ask how to pronounce my name, I say black and yellow. It's based on some school. It must be Pitt, uh, right? There's a song, Black and Yellow, I think, which... Okay, it's maybe it's Pittsburgh. I mean, the whole city, you can't live there without being... Okay. being <laughs> yeah, it's, 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 yes. Yes. <laughs> they have, like, black and gold days where the kids will wear the, the, the okay. school... The, not the school, the... Sorry Sports team colors, <laughs> yes. <laughs> so this, uh, this idea that you, uh, you know, you, you want to be invested in your project, but some people, and this is a personal decision, some people are okay to have it an industry project and they're happy to push it yeah. forward and then move on to the next one. Totally. You, you simply were not, and that's fine. So that's what everyone should think about, whether they're okay right. doing that or not. Exactly, and I think there is, I, I also am a keen gardener and... There's a um, a kind of mantra in gardening, which is right plant, right place. So you don't plant a plant that loves shade in a sunny spot. <laughs> and you don't plant a plant that needs warmth all year round in Pittsburgh or Ithaca because it's not going to survive in the winter, <laughs> you know. And so, and I, I think that that's also true for across science. There's a huge range of, of things that you can do with your PhD including, you know, in publication or science communication. Um, you know, there's so many different things you can do. And within industry, there's so many different types of jobs. So there's the jobs where if you're really fascinated by the technology and how do I, you know, people need to be able to address this question and they need a new technique or a new machine to do it. Um, how can we develop those assays and get really robust tools? Mm -hmm. You know, if that's what drives you, there's, there's jobs for that where you can make a huge impact in science. Um, you know, so of course academia is important, but I don't, it's not the be all and end all. And I think in reality for, there's not enough faculty positions for most of the people that we're training, but that doesn't mean that, um, we are not still making just as important contributions ultimately to science. Um, Sometimes more, you could argue, you know, if you're directly. So for some people, it's also they want to they want to be more at that edge where they feel like they're directly developing a, a drug that's going to help people. And they want to be closer to that part of it where I can see what I'm doing is actually leading to a drug in the clinic. Right. Um, right. For me, that personally, that scares me. The idea of saying, yeah, let's try this in people. I find that terrifying because, <laughs> <laughs> you know, sometimes it goes wrong, but I, it's great that there are people who, who do that and that that's also important. So yeah, it's finding what are the things that really motivate you and and drive you and that's not what your advisor tells you should drive you or <laughs> is what you're good at like your advisor can tell you you know we see people and we're talking about this morning you see people here like oh that would be so fantastic in academia but if that's not what's driving them then mm -hmm. then you know but it's hard don't stay. it's hard because these are young people and they have to make how these, do you know be, how do you know exactly yes. no totally and i've never known <laughs> I've always kind of <laughs> taken the next step and what's the next opportunity. And um, so I Well, think I think what your career has shown is you have to be flexible and you have yes. to be willing to change. And don't worry about having the one job for the rest of your life, right? Exactly. And, and don't cut anything off either. Don't burn bridges. Don't try to keep your opportunities open. So... Um, so for example, I did an industry postdoc, but I did it where I could publish. So those doors were still open. Um, and, uh, yeah, I think, I think always just try and keep as many options open as you can and, and don't worry about it too much. I think a lot of people really, really worry about what is my long-term career. And, um, I mean, it's good to have goals, but at the same time, I think we're kind of privileged, right? We have an opportunity to to do jobs sure. that are actually really fun and fulfilling. and Well, that's the point, is that we yeah. have pretty cool jobs, no matter whether you're in industry and academics. Right. And so to have such a cool job, you have to pay some prices, right? Yeah. It's tough. Uh, the best jobs are not without compromises. Yeah. So, yeah, that, uh, that's also true. I mean, my daughter was asking me this morning when we took the dog for a walk, uh, <laughs> 
what are, what are the jobs we can do straight out of high school? And I was listing some and then she's like, but those are all hard work. I'm like, I know. Yes. <laughs> um, yeah. And she was like, oh, but I'm like, yeah. So, I, you know, I went to school for a long time, but now, now it's really worth it. So. Um, um, so you had mentioned um, that you didn't always look ahead and have this long-term plan of I'm going to be working on this long-term. And in some ways, I can also kind of see that in your story because uh, at the beginning, you didn't know what TH17 cells were. So how could you have planned <laughs> to yeah. work on TH17 cells before, uh, yes. you, before they were out there? Um, I I definitely am excited to hear about some of the TH17 work as well, um, yeah, but I don't sure. want to cut off uh, some of the other parts of this conversation. Well, be, so, because you're currently in this story at Pittsburgh, okay. but what mode and, and had published, gosh, I was looking at your publications, really exciting work, as Brian mentioned on IL-17, which we'll get to learn about, and a little bit about regulatory yes. B cells recently, which mm-hmm. is fun. Um, but, yeah, I keep um, coming back to regulatory B cells. <laughs> yeah, that's so cool. What brought you then to Cornell, which is where you're at now? Yeah, so I wasn't, I wasn't necessarily looking to move specifically but again, it's when opportunities come up and then at the right time. So, um, I, yeah. And again, there's points in your career. So I'd been at Pittsburgh for, well, it was 10 and a half years now. It was like nine years at the time. I was at a point where I had decent funding and publications. People were starting to ask if I was interested in looking mm-hmm. at other faculty positions. Mm-hmm. And unfortunately, I think in a lot of places, some of the way that you get more funding for your lab is to get a retention package. And I was seeing other colleagues doing that and uh, including uh, male colleagues doing that and getting bigger pay raises, etc. Yeah. So, um, so I knew it was something I should at least be thinking about, but I hadn't formally interviewed anywhere. And then Deb Fowell, um, who I actually knew from having been to Rochester to give a talk and we had done some integrant work that kind of, uh, was related to some of the work that she had done. Um, sent me an email, uh, just saying, you know, I'm, I'm taking over this chair position and would you be interested? And I like Deb and I also really like that there's a woman chair of immunology. Um, there's not enough around. It's starting to increase for sure now, which is awesome. Um, and so I started looking at it more and, um, and then just got excited about the culture and the community at Cornell, the opportunity to have new collaborations and, and to make a change. It was a point of, you know, we'd been, when you've been somewhere for a while, things start to kind of, nothing was bad, but it's, for me, change has always been invigorating and exciting. And of course, during the pandemic as well, you know, I think all of us, well, many of us felt that kind of slump and the sort of, I don't know, it was just hard at times to kind of feel like picking back up again. Um, and for my kids, it was the right time to move. They're going into middle and high school. So they were about to make a big change in their schools anyway. Um, and, uh, my husband kind of needed a new job, but he wasn't looking for one. So it was (laughs) a good way to give him a, so just all of these things kind of lined up of like, this is a good opportunity. And, and one of the things during the pandemic, you know, I always try, I always try and take opportunities when you get them. I think I'm, I'm someone who likes change, but also I really feel like you can make opportunities out of things and you should use them. So for me, when the pandemic started, um, it was, you know, a summer, we had a gorgeous spring in Pittsburgh that year and a summer at home and spending a lot of time with my kids was great and actually getting to know them much better. I feel like a lot of their younger years, I was so busy. I don't actually, you know, I don't feel like I knew them as well. Um, and then spending more time outdoors and my daughter and I started, I had ridden as a kid and my daughter and I took up horse riding together. Mm -hmm. Um, again, which was spending more time outdoors. So again, when it was Cornell and Ithaca, um, it fit more our lifestyle or the lifestyle I wanted to have without having to commute 45 minutes to an hour mm-hmm. into the city. Um, I just found I didn't want to do that anymore. Mm-hmm. And so there's, I, I do think a lot of time we focus on the science, but you know, it's all, we're people too. So the whole picture has to fit. So for me, it was 
all those things came together to be like, yes, this is the, a good next place and to, uh, hopefully, uh, advance my research even more. Um, cause there's a number of things like some of the imaging facilities here. I'm really excited to work with and the technologies here to do more imaging of stromal cells and lymph nodes, which is what we're doing now. So yeah, I'm excited about new things as well. Yeah, we are really lucky. <laughs> now we got you. Yeah. Well, Cornell has invested a lot in immunology over the last few years, yeah. uh, expanded the number of immunologists and the resources that we have available. So it's right. really pushing the cutting edge for what we can do with our research programs. Yeah. And it's so f it's phenomenal to get people like you, Mandy, here to really push forward. So yeah. we're really excited about Thanks. the future of immunology for the next Yeah, five well, to and, years. and exactly right time. So yeah, it's, it's exciting for me to come and be part of a growing, right. a growing developing community and um, along with new junior faculty and more people to come. So Yeah, and like you said, yeah. Deb was a new chair, so we recruited her like about a year and a half ago mm -hmm. um, to to lead our department and, and, and drive that forward in, in immunology. Yeah. So it's, it, yeah, it's just like a coincidence of timings that it's just right. perfect. Right. So. Yeah, so when you see these opportunities, I think you have to take it. And and that's why I'm never, if people in my lab as well, when these things come up, and you, you can never be angry with people. If if it's the right opportunity and time for them, you have to support them and let them go as well because um, it doesn't happen. You know, in science, sometimes these things come up when you're not expecting them and you have to be willing to go and make that change. So, yeah. So when you started your program at Pitt, you were, you you kept working on TH17, mm -hmm. <laughs> your passion and love. So yes. can, can you talk a little bit about um, the research that you started and how it's sort of meandered over well, time, the yeah. different things that you've been and you can on? You can maybe for the audience, what is a TH17 yeah. cell? <laughs> like, why does yeah. it matter? For me Educate too. us, please. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so TH17 cells are, uh, so CD4 T cells have different functions when they're activated. Um, so until I guess 2005, we mostly knew about Th1 and Th2. So Th1 produced interferon gamma are really good for fighting uh, viruses and intracellular bacteria, activating macrophages, whereas Th2 were the allergy drivers and parasite uh, fighters. So, so CD4 T cells are, um, I guess you can think of them as kind of orchestrators of the immune system because they produce cytokines that then direct cells in the innate immune system like macrophages and neutrophils, but they also influence CD8 T cells and B cell function. So they kind of help to coordinate in a way. Um, and, and so I was interested in autoimmunity during my PhD and autoimmunity had always been attributed to Th1 cells because you do tend to see interferon gamma increased in tissues that um, are inflamed during autoimmune disease. Um, but then in 2005, this new subset was described that produce IL-17 as the major cytokine and, and IL-17 was required for a lot of the autoimmune models um, that were previously attributed to Th1. Um, and so, uh, that was where I started. And what was actually really cool was within a few years, um, drugs that target IL-17 started hitting the clinic and worked exceptionally well, um, especially for, for uh, psoriasis is one of the main ones where it actually changed the, the gold standard for what is a successful treatment for psoriasis because they started seeing almost cures well actually yeah and some people cures that that just hadn't really happened with any of the previous drugs so that was really exciting to see something go from mouse models through to humans and actually work in the clinic um but i was much more interested in just the fundamental parts of um what makes a th17 cell and then also we have th17 cells and this is the part that still really interests me is we all have th17 cells sitting in our barrier tissues so our skin and our gut um, mucosal tissues and they're doing good things because they're helping to control microbes mm -hmm. and it turns out they're also helping they actually act much more on our non-immune cells than immune cells a lot of the time so they act on epithelia and on fibroblasts so they help with wound healing they help with um, you know proliferation of epithelial cells that are damaged or um, or stripped away or just regenerating and uh 
and then they just help to balance microbes. But most of us don't experience inflammation from that. And yet at the start, TH17 cells got all the attention because they were inflammation drivers and they were the bad guys. Mm -hmm. And I think for me, the, the balance in the immune system is always what's fascinated me. Of you need, you need these responses, but too much is always a bad thing. Too little is bad. Even on the regulatory side, too many T regs are bad in, in cancer, for example. Um, and so, yeah, so a lot of my work over the, especially start of my career was more focused on understanding what makes a TH17 cell, uh, effective and then what makes them more pathogenic or, or less pathogenic. Um, and we've done various things looking at, you know, molecules that drive those functions. And then more recently, we started looking at, and again, <laughs> serendipity and opportunity, um, we had noticed that TH17 cells express an integrin that is important for their function. And this is where I knew Deb Fowles work actually, because with the integrin stuff. And, uh, just as a side project, because I'd always thought about, you know, we think about cells acting in peripheral tissues during autoimmune disease or infection. So they're driving inflammation in the skin or the CNS and what's happening in those tissues, but they get activated in the lymph nodes first. Mm -hmm. And whenever we looked in the lymph nodes, you can see that they're starting to produce IL-17 there already. So we were just curious about, you know, what are they, what are they doing in the lymph nodes? Are these integrins required and are they actually interacting in the lymph node environment? And so we looked at the ligands, which are these extracellular matrix proteins like fibronectin. Um, and it turned out that actually during, so we use the EAE model, but after immunization, as TH17 cells were developing, the amount of fibronectin was also increasing. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of like they were, uh, the road that they need to travel on is increasing as their numbers increase. But what was really surprising and cool was that the amount of fibronectin required, that increase in fibronectin required IL-17. Mm -hmm. So if we used IL-17 knockout, they had reduced fibronectin. So we're like, oh, that's interesting. Um, and it then we started thinking about, well, who's actually making fibronates in the lymph node? And it turns out it's these stromal cells called fibroblastic reticular cells, but I'll just say stromal cells. And I was of the school of, you know, fibroblasts are boring. <laughs> or, you know, they're just the structural cells in the body. And, um, but since they were changing and it actually turned out the numbers of these stromal cells in the lymph node they increase as a lymph node gets bigger, you need more of them, both for structure and because they actually produce chemokines and cytokines that are required for lymphocyte survival and migration. So they're actually doing a lot more than physical support. They're like producing almost like nutrient support as well. And they increase when you have inflammation. Um, and their numbers were not increasing without IL-17, but the lymph node was still big, which is why we hadn't even thought about this before, because the lymph node was inflamed, but these cells were not increasing. And so, yeah, so we ended up really getting into that of what are, what are these cells doing? And of course, other people have been studying these cells for years. Shannon Terley was, is one of, and Burkhard Ludwig are some of the pioneers in that field who've done a lot to actually show that these stromal cells on the lymph node are not just support cells, but they actually regulate the immune response. So they actually limit T cell activation and proliferation during an immune response as part of that balance. So again, that really piqued my interest because how, how are you balancing things? Um, and so then we ended up finding a new function for IL-17 as well, which was to actually drive the metabolic boosting of these cells because any cell that's proliferating needs to increase their metabolic capacity. Um, and we were looking at the lymph node, but I think for other tissues, it makes a lot of sense too. And actually there's now other papers coming out showing this in other, in cancer and in wound healing, other situations that IL-17 as part of this, uh, wound healing type response is also increasing its metabolic uh, pathways. Um, and yeah, so, so a lot of our work and then of course you, you have to, I'm, I have my interest, but of course it's what people in the lab can be convinced to work on. And <laughs> most of the people coming into the lab find those projects the most interesting. So, so a lot of what we're doing now is looking at how IL-17 and TH17 cells are, influencing stromal cells and then what are the outcomes on adaptive immunity so yeah, for example cool. it had been several other groups had shown that IL-17 was important to boost antibody production 
which kind of makes sense because most autoimmune diseases have both this tissue inflammation and high antibody. Um, but B cells don't really respond directly to IL-17. And what we were able to show is that it's the IL-17 acting on the stromal cells that's important and that that indirectly is actually supporting the antibody response. So we're still trying to figure out the exactly how that happens. Um, but I think, so I think, yeah, basically we kind of stumbled into this area, which... <laughs> And again, stromal cells, I think, are actually, fortunately for us, um, there's a huge amount of work being done in that field and single cell RNA sequencing has really advanced it because we now know that there's a huge amount of heterogeneity in different types of fibroblasts within tissues, depending on the type of tissue, but even within the tissue, there's at least 12 different subsets of stromal cells within the lymph node that are all compartmentalized and actually create the niches within the lymph node where dendritic cells come in, where T cells are activated, where the germinal center is, where, you know, the BT border. So they're actually really highly specialized within there to, to create those compartments that support the immune response. Um, so can I ask question. you something? So, yeah. uh, you know, <laughs> in general, people think about lymph node swelling, right? Mm -hmm. So when you have an illness or, uh, you know, right. yeah, vaccine you feel or whatever, you can feel them, they get big, right? So what are the components that contribute to that? Because you're saying one of the components is this proliferation of the stromal cells. Well, actually, but, they're, they're such a tiny fraction that I don't think really they actually contribute that, to... Right? They're, they proliferate in response to it to help support it. Yeah, but they're not, they're like less than 1% of all the cells in the So is it mostly T-cells or is it fluid or what? What is responsible? Because yeah. I've always wondered that. I feel like I should know that. <laughs> and I think some people study that a little bit, but I'm not sure it's fully... So I should know more about no. this. Um, so my understanding is that when you initially get dendritic cells, you know, they come from the periphery, they come in. When those signals initially start to happen, um, there's this phenomenon called lymph node shutdown, mm -hmm. which is essentially the egress is stopped, mm -hmm. but cells still come in. And, and so and the, lymph too, right? And lymph, yes. So everything's coming in, but the lymph node temporarily holds cells there, which makes sense, right? Because you want to increase the surveillance time and just increase the number because almost every T cell has a unique receptor. So um, you got to quickly go through all the T cells and find the ones that have the, the receptor that's going to recognize the right um, pathogen peptides. Um, so that's part of the initial swelling. I think there were studies as well, things like mast cells initially come in or, or create that swelling. Um, and that's happening way before things like T cell proliferation and B cell proliferation are actually happening. Those are kind of later events that will happen. Um, but I think initially it is the shutdown and the, just the retention. So that's more to do with lymphatics right. and, uh, signals there to prevent the egress. And then um, the integrins are important for telling the cells where to go. And so the, your right. studies on the integrins and, and when they're in the lymph node and how they leave the lymph node and where they know how to, how they know where to go. Right. That's all. Yeah. There's something we kind of, um, ended up because we started following the stromal cell component, not following as much, but I still think it's really interesting and, and hopefully something we'll collaborate with Deb on because yeah. I, I think there's, there's some very complementary interest in, uh, what T follicular helper cells are doing and, and how that's being regulated. So, um, so I have a question about yeah. um, TH17s mm -hmm. a little bit. Um, I think that sometimes there's this uh, idea or there, there's this thing that you mentioned really well that um, there's a question of are TH17s kind of the pathogenic cell um, or are they actually, you know, if, if, do we also think about things that they do that are useful? And so my question when uh, to you about those TH17s and um, their potential pathogenesis is that are they in those cases doing something inappropriate? Are they, were they perhaps activated inappropriately or is it almost a right plant, right place thing? Right. Um, <laughs> or is, a weed in the right. wrong place. <laughs> sure, right. Sure, exactly. right. Yeah. A, weed, a, yeah. weed in, a weed in the place that you want it is not a weed right. anymore. Exactly. Right. A weed is just a plant right. in a place you don't want it. Exactly. Yeah. Um, no, I think that's, that's a great question. And, and I think it's still something that we're, the field is, is still figuring out. Um, 
why, yeah, because one of the things that, that I think about as well is why are most autoimmune responses so strongly associated with TH17 cells? You know, why don't you have more autoimmune TH2 type diseases or autoimmune? Um, and so I guess my, my sort of philosophical thinking on that is, um, well, one of the studies we've done in, in human T17 cells was looking at co-stimulation, how they respond to co-stimulation and, and T cell receptor signaling and finding that surprisingly T17 cells actually really like very low levels of co-stimulation, which is in contrast to other T cells and, and in contrast to our thinking that co-stimulation is the signal to, to tell a T cell that they should get activated instead of becoming tolerant. Um, and so, and usually pathogens, you know, th uh, infections that are causing damage are what will drive high co-stimulation. And so that's a safe situation to cause inflammation because you have a pathogen. So the fact that TH17 cells seem to almost prefer conditions with low co-stimulation, um, makes me think that that's part of why autoreactive cells are more likely to be TH17 because you're more likely to see self, self proteins in the presence of low co-stimulation. And then the other thing is this, uh, I do think the, this finding that IL-17 seems to contribute to wound healing type of responses and that, that these cells are mostly present in barrier surfaces where you do have rapid turnover of tissue. So, you know, you think of central nervous system, for example, the brain is not turning over and there's very few immune cells there and microbes there, and that's the normal healthy situation. So whereas in the gut and the skin, we do have um, turnover in IL-17, but it's... Um, yeah, so, so what are the conditions that allow those cells to exist and not cause frank inflammation? And, I, and there is some idea, like it seems like the level of IL-1 may help to determine that or IL-23. So I think the cytokine environment of what else is going on, um, the metabolic state of the T cells themselves makes a difference. So the ones that are highly metabolically active are more likely to cause inflammation. Um, so I think that usually the environment is controlling the T cell pathogenicity, if that makes sense. Um, but then what makes that go wrong when you have like multiple sclerosis or, or psoriasis or an autoimmune disease? I think we still don't have a good understanding of that. So really what that we can probably say uh, about all this is that everything is an immune cell. Really, I mean, yeah. the yes. <laughs> we could say that even ones that we thought were structural cells are right. also immune cells. <laughs> so, so not only, as you said at the beginning, um, does immunology impact everything? Everything <laughs> is also immunology. Right. Yes. <laughs> yes. Well, and as, yeah, exactly. Everything immunology, everything immunology affects everything and almost every cell. Yeah, that's one of the things I find fascinating is that um, these stromal cells essentially become immune cells, and and the fact that IL seventeen seems to be influencing that so much, um, I think, yeah, continues to make it interesting, not just in peripheral tissues, but also actually even in the immune site in the lymph node. So yeah, so that's something we're we're also trying to understand in the context of infection then. How does that um contribute to outcomes during infection? Because again, there you have this wide range from very mild disease symptoms to very severe disease symptoms, even in the same infection and um even with controlling the infection. So what what's kind of regulating that balance? Um, is something we're becoming more interested in. And, and again, here being actually in a microbiology and immunology department and, and even closer to people that are thinking about infection all the time was a good opportunity. And one of the models that you were using is a fungal model. We don't talk about fungi much, right? Uh, we don't, so Sarah Gaffin uses Candida a lot, yes, and we've collaborated a lot on yeah. projects. Um, yeah, and we, sh we probably should because um, actually – Fungal infections seem to be one of the major class of pathogens that, that IL-17, in terms of yeah, pathogens rather than commensals, is important for. So people who have uh, spontaneous 
genetic defects in the IL-17 pathway tend to present with these really severe mucocutaneous uh, fungal infections, so really invasive um, fungal infections that are penetrating through the skin as their major um, clinical symptoms. So, uh, yeah, I think in terms of why we have TS-17 cells, that's a major thing, yeah. Um, yeah. Um, yes, but mostly that's where, we, like, Sarah Gaffin is the, right. the expert in that area, and um, we've contributed a little bit or helped with, like, complementary autoimmune models to that. Um, yeah, one of the main, actually, in terms of infection, We've been doing um, Citrobacter rodentium mm -hmm. infection in the gut, which is a, a really widely used model for pathogenic E. coli of humans um, and uh, drives TF17, as well as actually one of the things I think that's nice about it is it's not just TF17, you also need IL-22 and you need antibody. Um, so it allows us to kind of look at a more complete picture um, rather than just, you know, what's this one molecule doing to this one cell type in that. And then we've also been doing, um, actually pre-COVID, we were doing some work with viruses as well and and looking at LCMV infection and really, really surprised. This was, again, one of the, uh, as I was, I would encourage students and postdocs when you have an idea that seems a little out there, I mean, you always need to ask permission from your PI, but, you know, <laughs> try these things out because my postdoc wanted to try, he had a friend in another lab that was doing LCMV infections and we had all these findings under a TH17 context where IL-17 was really influ influencing stromal cells. And so it was like, well, what about in viruses? And I thought, well, at least we'll be able to rule it out and say, yeah, there's no effect. So I was like, go ahead. And actually, really surprisingly, IL-17 has this very beneficial effect during chronic infection with LCMV where the mice that lack IL-17 uh, after about a week started losing more and more weight and they had to end the experiment early. And uh, so that that was great. And we're trying to finish that paper now. And I got an R01 based on that project. Oh, wow. So try things out. And to me, the most interesting science is always those. It's never what we can, well, it's never what I predict. At least I'm wrong at least half the time. So, so um, what, what fraction of people with immunopathologies are based on IL-17 and those cells, do you think? Of which immunopathologies? Any, any kind that involves the cells or the, or the cytokine. Do you, do you have any idea of how many people out there with them? Um, diseases where you have rheumatoid arthritis, right? Yeah, so so in I would say in general in autoimmune, most autoimmune, well, I would say every autoimmune disease, people have identified IL-17 to be increased and in various ways increased in the tissue. Um, but the clinical trials that have been done haven't have been kind of surprising. Actually, that's a, a really interesting one again of uh, when you think about your results. Just because something's increased in a situation doesn't mean it's driving it, and and the immune system is so complex. Mm -hmm. So um, for psoriasis, for ankylosing spondylitis, um, blocking IL seventeen or IL seventeen receptor is highly effective. But in IBD, so colitis, where that was some of the original discoveries and IL-17 is clearly increased and TH17 cells are clearly increased, um, the IL-17 trials failed. They actually had to be stopped early um, because they weren't showing efficacy and some people got worse, which was very surprising to every all of us in the field. Like that seemed like such a slam dunk. And then what was, what was even more surprising is blocking IL-23 is really effective for colitis. And, um, so IL-23 is one of the, is thought to be one of the key drivers of TH17 cell pathogenicity. So one of the main things IL-23 does is drive IL-17. In psoriasis, you can block IL-23 or IL-17. They're both equally effective. But in colitis, blocking IL-23 works well. IL-17 makes things worse. And so, um, this is the cool thing about studying the immune system, right? There's always surprises and it's, it's never simple, which makes it hard to. Um, but I think the key thing there is IL-17 has beneficial effects in the gut, 
because it's helping to regulate microbes, helping to heal injured tissue, which you have a lot of during IBD. IL-23 is not only driving IL-17, and there's there's other cytokines that will also drive some IL-17. IL-23 is probably driving these additional functions of IL of TH17 cells, things like GMCSF production, um, and others that are are um, and and can also act on other cells in TH17, and so those pathogenic functions in the IBD context are more important. So it's, um, a, it's a substantial portion of, of diseases that affect humans. And you, you've told right. us some cases where you can add an antibody and, and, and treat, but wouldn't it be better to understand the underlying problem? Is that at all possible? Is that just totally um, difficult so because of the complexity, right? Of, of what's driving it in the first yes, place? Yes. Yeah, yeah. And so... I guess that's something you could kind of debate because, so some people would say absolutely yes, because then we can target that. The problem in autoimmunity, especially, so infection, I think, yes, because we can try and block the infection or we can target the process of what's going to make you become hyper responsive and, and cause, you know, severe COVID or whatever. Um, the problem in autoimmunity is the disease develops so slowly after, so, during so many years that by the time the person gets to clinic, gets to the right clinic, gets the diagnosis, which can, for some people, takes years to actually get a definitive diagnosis. I think we're, we're so long past those triggering events that it's, it's too late. But there are studies, so especially in the, the rheumatology field, where um, they're really trying to identify very early onset or even pre-onset patients based on yeah. their predisposition, like the likelihood of um, you know, family genetics and other exposures. Um, cause there's some very interesting studies actually from army. The army took blood samples from people right. for years mm -hmm. and stored them. Um, they and do so, that, yeah. <laughs> yeah, well, they probably do it now. And, uh, but it's been very useful because it meant that, uh, you could do studies going back and looking at autoimmune antibodies, which in mm -hmm. RA are well defined, um, and for lupus too. And, right. For people who develop clinical disease, like known, and you can go back and look, and their autoimmune antibodies were already there like one to two years before they actually had any signs yeah. of disease. So, so I think really autoimmune disease, like cancer in a lot of ways, is a series of unfortunate mm -hmm. events that come together to eventually manifest in breaking that threshold. And, and that, that's kind of a problem with our mouse models, right? We kind of we hit them hard and make them all develop disease at the same time. And um, we're compressing these years of events into a single time point. So the, the army uh, was where they got the data showing that uh, an antibody to EBV is involved in MS. Mm. They had yeah. sera from years before a lot of these people got yep. EBV disease, so they right. could make the correlation. So right. very useful. Yeah, the yeah, numbers yeah. in that, those studies were amazing. Um, yeah. <laughs> so, so speaking to hitting something at the same time with a disease, I want to switch to the infectious disease context, particularly viruses. Uh, mm -hmm. And I was looking at your science immunology paper where you were really interested in looking at this concept of trained immunity. And you demonstrated right. that nonspecific inflammation induced IL-17 secretion by these stromal cells, which helped antibody production against Citrobacter, which right. is really fascinating. And so I'm wondering if if we can better understand IL-17 production and the cells that produce them in humans looking at SARS-CoV-2. So do you think that we could better understand the responses to SARS-CoV-2 based on pre-existing inflammation and the contribution of IL-17 and then a person's antibody response to either the infection or the vaccine, right? Um, and of course, is it different because this is a respiratory pathogen? And how does this <laughs> that paper play in the context outside the gut? Yeah, and and that's something we're thinking about a lot as well. Of obviously extending those findings. So, so just to summarize, because. I can't read every paper, so I don't expect many people to have read the paper. But uh, what we showed was that, so it was all using the gut as a model. And part of the reason we chose that was because the gut can heal well. And so you have a tissue where you can do something, activate the lymph nodes, and then come back later. Um, 
And again, this is where I was 100% wrong in my prediction because <laughs> what I was thinking was if we cause inflammation and we activate the stromal cells in the lymph node, now they're going to sort of lose those uh, regulatory properties. And if we come in with another insult, they're going to allow the immune response to overreact. And this could be how we're like driving, you know, losing tolerance and causing autoimmunity. And actually what happened, so we gave DSS as a model to just cause nonspecific inflammation, but we knew that that activated the stromal cells in the lymph node and expanded their number. And then we waited um, a couple of weeks, even up to six weeks, um, till everything had fully settled down. And then we infected the mice with Citrobacter rodentium, this model of E. coli, which um, is handled fine by mice, but it does cause colitis, temporary colitis, while they clear the bacteria. Um, and to our great surprise, what happened was, um, indeed, the antibody response was enhanced by having previous IL-17 stimulation. So that previous inflammation had primed the lymph node to generate a better antibody response. But the, inf the inflammation in the gut was much less. I mean, these mice seemed to have very little inflammation in their gut, even though they were still shedding bacteria. So, so really it made us think about, you know, asymptomatic infection versus severe inflammatory disease and that difference. And it turned out that the reason that they were able to control the infection, it wasn't that they were preventing infection. They got the infection, they were shedding bacteria, but then they cleared it and it, they were making this enhanced antibody response, um, which I think helped to clear the bacteria. But at the same time, those increased B cells were also producing more IL-10. And so that was actually reducing the inflammation in the tissue. And so now you had a situation where you were able to deal with the infection effectively, but in a non-inflammatory way. Um, so obviously we'd love to draw, you know, and be like, oh, well, so when you're infected with SARS-CoV-2, then it's going to, your, your prior inflammatory experience may make you more likely to make these IL-10 producing B cells. Certainly, um, these IL-10 producing B cells exist in humans and are being studied in transplantation and autoimmunity and, and as potential ways to try and treat disease because if you could enhance them. Um, yeah, whether that is actually contributing, obviously, you know, I, I'm always very wary of extrapolating too far. But these are things that we'd like to test, at least in the lab of, you know, we've tested in the case of a nonspecific like injury type inflammation followed by a bacterial infection. What about virus? Would it have the same beneficial effect for virus? Um, what if you had a different type of initial inflammatory insult? Would that change the way that the B cells respond later? But I do think, and again, having kids you know, you extract, you, you put everything back to your own situation experience. But, you know, when you first send your kids to daycare, they get everything. <laughs> you have a year of being sick and the whole family gets sick. And, you know, it's like they, they get everything. And, they, but they also obviously get everything, right? How can they have so many infections and then not be exposed later? And of course they are being exposed later. They just don't get as sick. Um, and I, I do think that that's partly, you know, your immune system is being trained. And and we know about immune training actually from beautiful work from other people um, in myeloid cells where over time this exposure really helps them to respond more appropriately to infection. But we also think that the stromal cell chain training of the actual lymph nodes is helping to set thresholds for the type of immune responses that will be mounted in the future and and some of those are actually, um, although we think of IL-17 as being pro-inflammatory, it's actually priming for a more kind of regulatory type of response. But um, yeah, so so maybe those those types of exposures during your childhood are also are training the lymph node itself as well as the myeloid system. Have you looked right. at timing? Because yeah. this is something that I've been thinking about where we were, we were, we were all kind of like holed up and nobody was sick except for people who got COVID for like a long time. Uh -huh. Whereas we normally get colds and exposures right. and things and there was no exposure. And so how is that going to influence when people now start to get colds and things again? Is that going to make it worse or better? I don't know. Yeah, I don't According know. To, to what you're saying, maybe we're worse off because we were kind of tickling it along the, the mm -hmm. way and keeping ourselves trained. I do wonder that, yeah, whether, um, 
those regulatory processes start to go down over time as well. The and regulating then, weaning. Yes. <laughs> Re- um, weaning regulation. Yeah. Yeah, I, I do wonder that. That's interesting. And certainly the first call I got <laughs> where I was like, I don't remember being this sick from, and it was a cold, <laughs> not a not COVID, but um, yeah, I, I think there is probably something to that too of uh, – we need some boosting, right? That's part of the hygiene hypothesis too, right? We've, right. we've evolved to be kind of dealing with a certain level of pathogen exposure. And, um, yeah, I think we'll find out this year as <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> when all the schools go we back without masks. masks and students go back. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Well, and I, I, having talked to people about this concept and some had asked, you know, regarding, well, then kids should be exposed to pathogens. And this kind of has mm-hmm. led down the road in certain contexts to, well, they then they don't need to be vaccinated. I mean, they need to be exposed. And of course, I think the opposite, we can look to children who have high burdens of enteric infections and they actually, you know, do not fare well, particularly in high, high burden, high mortality countries, rotavirus, norovirus. So I think right. in those contexts, the gut becomes even more complicated, you know, in regards to constant inflammation and this enteric dysbiosis. And so it's kind of like the other extreme. Um, yeah. Yeah. No, totally. And I think that's, that's in some ways the challenge. Well, the challenge always in studying the immune system is there's so many different things that contribute mm-hmm. to it as well as, you know, nutrition, even stress, right. I think, um, right. I, I think is sort I mean, of the gut understudied in terms a of huge amount of, of hormones. I mean, the gut mm-hmm. is, Mm-hmm. Highly uh, connected to the hormonal means, um, you know, that crosstalk. Right. So, yeah. Right. Yeah. Um, yes. So it's very multifactorial. And that, that's why I never like to give an absolute answer on anything because I think it's so <laughs> context dependent. <laughs> so it's not what the journalists like. They want I an know, answer. <laughs> I know. And reviewers, right? Everyone likes the very clear answer and it's uh, things are subtle. Um, but that's what keeps us in jobs as well. <laughs> I think there's still so much more to know. So, yeah. Um, so how do you think your original experience in veterinary training um, influences what you do with science today? Yeah, I think um, in the end, I was glad that I took that route because what it did instill was, I think, more of the, what's the right, not really translational, but understanding you know, the basic science through to influencing systems and pathology and pathogenesis. Um, and it's certainly, I think, it's, I think, I think the immunology field is unique to this, but I feel like we're kind of jack of all trades a bit in immunology. Like we're, I think it's a nice thing about the field that people will branch into neurology and branch into, you know, skin biology and stromal cells and things that are not really immune cells, but we kind of just, do it all. Um, so I think having that kind of grounding in anatomy and physiology and the language of, of biology, maybe a little more than you would get by doing kind of a more general education was, um, was probably quite useful. And for being able to try and put things in bigger picture or think from a more kind of clinical translational viewpoint. On the other hand, I do feel like I missed out on some of the like hardcore biochemistry and, um, you know, some of those cl- classes that I, I think undergrads have done better than me. But, you know, so you mean you after years, you, you lose that anyway. So. You, you, you can't draw the four triphosphates now on the board? Oh, I don't think so. <laughs> Are there opportunities now that you're out of vet school that you think that you could take advantage of or not really? Because there's yeah. some there's some interesting collaborations that people have started when they come here. Yeah. No, it's definitely something I'm thinking about as, um, you know, there's some really great equine immunologists here and, uh, and a lot of different species. Um, and the thing I keep thinking about as well is, you know, we... I think immunologists and NIH study sections, unfortunately, are really focused on the mouse as a model for humans. Mm -hmm. And why is the mouse such a great model? I mean, I know it's a good model as a model because it breeds fast. We've got all the transgenics and um, it's very well characterized. But there's a lot of things about mice biology that are very different 
to the human experience, including longevity, you know, lifespan and breeding cycle, all these things. So, um, and then also just size of tissues that you can sample is very mm -hmm. limited. Um, and then we keep them in these tiny cages in a very controlled environment. So I'm thinking a lot about, uh, you know, for example, with horses where they're much larger, they live a lot longer, they experience stresses that are somewhat more similar to what we do and, and, and their environment is a little more um, diverse and they're obviously much larger animals and they have a lot of similar issues to um, owning horses now. <laughs> like there's a lot of similar things to humans, you know, they get autoimmune uveitis, they get autoimmune disease, they get a lot of osteoarthritis and inflammatory disease. Um, and so, yeah, it's something I'm interested in kind of potentially what is pursuing. The, is how what to, are the horse reagents like? Do you have <laughs> well, equine antibodies to IL-17? <laughs> yeah, actually, I don't know for IL-17, but, but the, I think so. They're, they are better than you would think. And okay, especially here, so mm -hmm. Bettina Wagner, for example, has, has been a pioneer in developing a lot of reagents for the horse. So, so, um, Yes, so we'll see how that goes. Steph but. would argue that pigs might be a good model, right? <laughs> you know, pigs are great models for immunology, particularly mm -hmm. the gut, uh, neonatal piglets. So just to put a, a plug out there for using pigs. A little yeah. smaller than horses. You know? Yeah. <laughs> they, they make more babies. They, they, they breed That's true. faster and have... They breed uh, a lot yeah. faster. Yeah. Well, if you would say you can ride the horse, right? That's good. <laughs> yeah. Apparently I Picture. can't ride every horse. <laughs> Um, yeah, no, I just, I think, again, it's that thing of like being open to opportunities and, yeah. and different ways to get at problems. Um, I think one of the things that people overlook using veterinary species, especially like companion animals, mm -hmm. is two things. One, they occupy the same environment as us. Right. Yeah. And so yeah. they're exposed to a lot of the same things. Um, and so other environmental influences would be, you know, yeah. comparable. Uh -huh. The other thing is, is that they spontaneously develop these diseases. Right. right. And there are exactly, yeah. distinct advantages to looking at that as opposed to a mouse model where we have right. to treat them with a drug or knock out a cell right. or, or um, do a particular infection right. or whatever to drive the disease that we're interested right. in studying. And it's controlled, which has its own advantages, but then there's a lot that you miss yeah. because it's not happening spontaneously. And, well, and just because it resembles can, the disease doesn't mean it's the same pathogenesis. Right, yeah, exactly. If it's not spontaneous. Exactly. So, yeah. and, and there's opportunities to try therapies as well that right. then may be translational to human. Yeah. And so, so this idea of this one health is a big thing mm -hmm. that we have here at Cornell where it's the environment, the individual, you know, and so it's, it's all connected together. Yeah. And so uh, the human, the animal, and the environment Environment. And so we're not only using animals for food production, but they're, they're companion animals. Yeah. And then there's, you know, the equines and things. And so we can use what we learn from them to influence what we, what we study in human and treating human. Right. And we can also, most of the time we've thought about, you know, what we find in human, we can then try to treat animals. Yeah. But mm -hmm. there has to be better synergy and con yes. connecting back and forth that people are not really appreciating as much as they could. And yeah. so there's a lot of pioneers here at Cornell that are driving that kind of influential thinking. Yeah. No, and I think that's, that's uh, yeah, pioneers, as you say, because I think that this could be so much more uh, better used. And and there's a clinical need on the animal side too, right? I, Absolutely. I want to treat my dog and my horse to give them a long, healthy life too. So. Yeah, absolutely. Um, but I think also, oh, I was going to say something else I've forgotten now. No, it's gone. It'll come, It'll come back to me. <laughs> It'll come they back to yeah. pigs too. They treat the pigs here. <laughs> <laughs> they treat anybody here. Oh, my God. So did you know... I think that, I think this is published as well that, well, no, so it's published like, um, if you look at people and pets in the same household, you share the same microbiome mm -hmm. with your pets, mm -hmm. which makes a lot of sense. But I remember a friend of mine has, um, ulcerative colitis and she commented that her doctor had asked about her dog, whether she had a dog and whether the dog had any IBD problems. Cause apparently it's not uncommon that if someone in the household has colitis, the dog also oh, suffers wild. from it, which oh. again, maybe, you know, what an opportunity to try and understand more what those influences are. 
For her, actually, it worked the other way. They got a dog after she developed UC and her UC has been better. And she just, so, you know, <laughs> oh, that's all anecdotal too. is the kind of thing you could, you know. Yeah, there's, you there's know, not a lot of people Right on the internet, scientists both. say, but, um, but yeah, but, you know, did it sharing, changing her microbiome with the dog, maybe that helped her too. So um, <laughs> I think there's, yeah, a lot of these interesting things that you could get at. Um, the issue is convincing the funding agencies that that is worth it funding is, and tricky. changing. Yeah. It's tricky. So. Brian, Steph, anything else you'd like to know? Well, I mean, yeah, many green. things I'd like to know. I could, you know, let's be part of this conversation for a long time, but I, I'm good right now, I guess. <laughs> I have one more yeah, question. No, I, yeah. I, I agree. Ahead, I, I, this has been wonderful. And, you know, I, yeah, looking at your papers, I mean, we could talk for another hour, but, um, <laughs> but I, and I really appreciate your, your insight into your career because I think it's, it's not often, I mean, you can find somebody who was that was a veterinarian and then went to do their PhD. You can find people who were in industry and then came back, but you've kind of done all of that. So it's great to, to get your story. Yeah. It's a meandering path. <laughs> so I have one, one question for you. If you, if you had not been a scientist, what would you have done? Uh, <laughs> I love this question that you asked. Yeah, me too. What would I have actually done or what, what did I think I would do? <laughs> I always wanted to be an author, which mm -hmm. I suppose in some ways I am now, but like actually a, like a fiction author. Um, fiction, okay. That's yeah. Cool. Um, or some kind of something interesting with animals, like mm -hmm. a, I don't know, work mm -hmm. on a horse ranch or something. <laughs> totally different not a veterinarian though right? no that's good i like that because a lot of people say oh i'd be a doctor right it's like yeah, it's no. too close so students last night that i went to dinner with were very interested in what kind of answers people give to this yeah. question right? oh, yeah yeah we get all kinds of answers anyway. well they're they're at the choice they're at the the point where like did i make the right decision <laughs> can, I, can i get out now oh yeah so we're we're, we're trying to keep but as you said even you're, a, you could still say that I write the make, make the right decision at some days, right? I mean, you just yeah, don't know, totally. Right? Yeah, totally. And, and I think, <laughs> but also other decisions, other decisions would have also been the right decision. I don't yeah. think, I don't yeah. think there's one. And you can always change. There's there's yeah. always time for change, and you can have hobbies. So now my animals are my hobby, and you know, I think it's good to have those other things too. All right, that that is immune. Number 59. The next one's going to be a nice number, 60. That's yeah. actually in a couple of weeks, I think. We it is. One, right? Yeah. Back to their all online stuff, right? We can't. Yeah. <laughs> can't but then I think we'll be we'll be all together in person at some yeah, point before yeah, the end up. of the year, all which right, will be that's exciting. That's number 59. You can find the show notes at microbe.tv slash immune if you want to send us a question or a comment. Immune at microbe.tv. If you enjoy what we do, consider supporting us. Go to microbe.tv slash contribute. Your contributions are federal, U.S., tax deductible. Uh, so for this special episode here in Ithaca, New York at Cornell University, our guest is Mandy McGeechy. Thank you so much for you. talking with us and good luck here in Ithaca. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Cindy Leifer is here at Cornell University. Uh, I forgot your Twitter because I don't have my notes in at front. At Cindy Leifer. That's it. Just that Cindy Lifer. Yep. There you go. Thank you, Cindy. Yeah, thank you. This is great. I'm glad to have everybody on my home turf. <laughs> so it was nice. Steph Langle's at Duke University. Stephanie Langle on Twitter. Thank you, Steph. Yes, thank you all. Thanks, Mandy. This is great. And Brianne Barker's at Drew University. Bioprof Barker on Twitter. Thanks, Brianne. Thanks. This is really great. Thanks, Mandy. Uh, I'm now going to go uh, read uh, your science immunology paper and uh, play <laughs> around with my syllabus. <laughs> oh, good luck. <laughs> is your course starting soon, Brian? Uh, two weeks or a week and a half. All right. I'm Vincent Racaniello. You can find me at virology.ws. Who am I thanking for this? I need to have my notes or I don't know what to say. <laughs> you want me to Here say it? Steve, Steve Neal. Steve Neal oh, percussion. Oh, music on Play immune it. is by Steve yep. Neal. <laughs> do we have an? Do we have a link for him? No, not anymore. We used to. Music on immune is by Steve Neal. Thanks for listening, everyone. We'll see you next time on Immune, the podcast that's infectious. Mm -hmm.